Dobar dan svima i dobrodošli na drugi dan ove konferencije. Ja ću dalje danas pričati na engleskom. So let me start by saying thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Digital 2020 covers themes related to information and the means both older and newer by, by which we share it. I'm grateful to Color Media and Robert Choban for creating this venue by which we can consider these important topics. Information and the means with which we share and present it shape our perceptions of the world. These perceptions affect our behavior as consumers, political actors, and members of a community. The COVID-19 crisis is a perfect illustration of the seriousness of the information challenge. Scientific experts have shared a variety of opinions about optimum ways to control the spread of the pandemic. Expert views were supplemented by a range of opinions from other sources, easily spread through the digital information space, offering COVID-19 related advice that ranged from insightful to neutral to actually harmful. Until COVID-19 came along, we were more accustomed to hearing about the influence of the digital information space on politics. In every country, politicians battle for consent and support from their populations. This common political goal plays out differently in each country according to specific conditions. One year ago, Freedom House described methods used by authorities in Serbia to influence the media. According to Freedom House, these include financial and economic pressure, selective enforcement of laws and harassment. The report issued by Freedom House says flooding the media landscape with their own political messages allows those in power to dominate the political agenda, divert public discussion away from sensitive issues, and ultimately control and manipulate the public sphere. Whether or not you agree with that analysis, this is just one troubling aspect of the modern communications environment about which I would like to speak. I make my remarks today as my three-year diplomatic posting to Serbia is coming to an end. For me, this is a time of reflection and a time to to consider how to build a more positive future. A century ago, we would learn about faraway places through books, newspapers, and photographs. Today, video technology and social media posts create a powerful illusion of being in places we have not visited. Despite the apparent power of modern communication technologies, my posting to Serbia has reminded me that a true appreciation and understanding of a place can only come from being there. Virtual presence or telepresence may give an illusion of proximity. However, there is a broad spectrum of information that technology filters out. My travels have taken me to Bor and Niš, to Novi Pazar and Novi Sad. I have met people in many other places in Serbia and in the other two countries that we cover from Belgrade, Montenegro and North Macedonia. Yesterday, I was in Sombor and Stapar, meeting weavers who were patiently and passionately practicing centuries old handicrafts. In person, we see more and we hear more. We have random experiences and encounters. There is more spontaneity and more uncontrolled exchanges. In person, more people and more phenomena enter our range of, perce of perception. Looking at a map of the world, Serbia may not appear as a massive territory. However, when you enter Serbia, you realize the country is vastly larger than its spatial dimensions. There is a richness of history and tradition and culture and extraordinary variation from region to region. History endows Serbia with a powerful identity and national pride. My three years in this country have convinced me that this country's history is both an advantage and a disadvantage. Too many battles that should remain in the past continue to shape behavior in the present. Personally, I believe that Serbia could achieve the greatness to which she aspires by focusing on the challenges of the future and not by looking to settle scores from the past. History is more than a collection of knowledge. It influences us. Public consciousness is shaped by the narratives to which we are exposed. By examining the narratives in the public information space, we can determine whose interests they serve. We can ask whether these narratives serve the needs of political authorities and media companies, or whether they serve the needs of the population. 
Are narratives encouraging reconciliation and partnership or reinforcing division? The future in which we want to live and in which we want our children and grandchildren to live depends in part on finding common ground and common purpose. The world and human society have always been in a state of continuous evolution. The narratives to which we are exposed are shaped by technological possibilities and their application. We can rightly ask ourselves how social networks and the digital information space are shaping our perceptions and behaviors. Canadian philosopher Marshall McLuhan suggested that we may, must pay careful attention to, the to this technology, to the medium itself, perhaps even more than to the information it carries. Technology is not value neutral. In fact, technologies often have an impact that is opposite to the one anticipated. When broadcast radio was first introduced in Canada, it was heralded as a powerful tool of national unity. Radio was described as a means of engaging Canadians across a vast geographic territory in a national conversation. This conversation did not, of course, take place as intended because radio broadcasts are a one-way, not a two-way form of communication. When television arrived, it was presented as a powerful educational tool. We realize now that television is, above all, a form of entertainment. Analysis and, inf and information delivered by television is often packaged in the same way as entertainment designed to attract viewers by heightening drama and emotion. This tension between information and infotainment has been with us for a long time. Media analysts often lead us to believe that the 1950s and 1960s were a golden era for the public information space, when journalists were able to maintain high standards of professional journalism. However, even then, editors and journalists were concerned with attracting readers and viewers. The media market is more competitive today. The digital information space has fragmented audiences, jeopardizing the profitability of media companies. The potential for conflict between standards of professional journalism and the business needs of media companies has never been greater than now. In the past 25 years, the digital information space has had other consequences. The internet was heralded as the most powerful information engine yet designed by the human mind. Infinitely superior to an encyclopedia, the internet delivered to citizens instant access to general and specialized up-to-date knowledge on almost any topic of interest. Little did we suspect that the internet was also the most powerful disinformation engine yet devised, able to deliver specially tailored lies and falsehoods directly into hands, homes, and public discourse. The history of communication technology teaches us that opportunity and risk arrive together. As a result, we must choose our path carefully. Let me describe one of these risks and one of the ways Canada is responding to it. This risk is weaponized disinformation. When Canada chaired the Group of Seven Industrialized Countries in 2018, it led discussions on threats to democracy from foreign actors. Among G7 leaders, the concern was great and was great enough that a G7 rapid response mechanism was created. The coordination unit for the G7 rapid response mechanism is housed in my home ministry, Global Affairs Canada, in Ottawa. The mechanism strengthens coordination in identifying and responding to diverse threats to democracies. An important part of the mechanism's work is sharing information and analysis to enable a coordinated response to threats. Because of the nature of the internet and the sometimes subtle methods for manipulation of information content, the rapid response mechanism for combating foreign interference works through exposure rather than prohibition. It is extraordinarily difficult to contain the spread of deceit on the internet. However, exposure represents the use of valid information to combat the spread of weaponized disinformation. Prohibition of certain types of use and certain types of content on the internet would not only be difficult to enforce, but prohibition and other legal restrictions carry risks. 
these methods could be used to restrict legitimate forms of information sharing and communication. Canada is an active member of the Freedom Online Coalition. This coalition seeks to ensure that human rights are protected online, namely freedom of opinion and expression, association, assembly, and privacy. We believe these rights are important both offline and online. One of the areas in which Canada is heavily involved in the role is in the role of artificial intelligence. Canada is the chair of the Task Force on Artificial and, and Artificial Intelligence and Human Rights within the Freedom Online Coalition. Our challenge is to ensure that learning and decision-making algorithms are optimized, not just for technical, economic, and security performance, but also to ensure that international human rights laws and standards are upheld. These are some of the very specific questions we are examining, but they are not the only worrying questions. Sometimes we may look upon the digital information space as a neutral space, a tabula rasa, on which we place our own marks. In fact, like all communication media, the digital information space is not neutral, as the theories of Marshall McLuhan remind us. Let us consider access. The, tech the technical capacity to access the internet can vary enormously. In August, I visited Canada where I had to quarantine for two weeks as an anti-COVID precaution. I passed those two weeks at my parents' cottage in the countryside where there was no internet access or cell phone coverage. Most of us are so accustomed to having constant access to the internet that we consider it almost as essential as electricity and running water. Many of us might not remember the last time we spent two weeks without access to email, social networks, and news sites. In the Global South, less than half of the population is connected to the internet. Of those connected, internet access disproportionately benefits men, urban, resi urban residents, and young people. Individuals without the internet may be prevented from accessing potentially life-saving information about COVID-19, staying in touch with friends and family, increasing their productivity, and other forms of self-empowerment. The most commonly used language on the internet is English, greatly privileging access for those who speak English and enabling their participation in digital life and the digital economy. Canada takes these access questions seriously. As chair of the Task Force on Artificial Intelligence and Human Rights, we are working to integrate gender-based analysis, diversity, and inclusion into discussions about artificial intelligence. Our goal is to ensure that digital information respects human rights and serves the broader interests of society. We can celebrate our entry into a globalized digital information space that opens up possibilities that were considered science fiction just a few decades ago. When I was a child, nobody would have thought that a communications device that fits in your pocket could also be used to check the weather and headlines, watch movies, buy goods and services, and share limitless pictures of cats and dogs on social media. Despite these achievements, we must remind ourselves that there is a dark side to the digital information space. If we are not careful, this dark side could grow larger rather than shrink. We used to be troubled by the impact of television on standards of professional journalism. The questions we face today seem vastly more complex and numerous. Awareness of the challenges in the digital information space will help us ensure that we do not succumb to the risks we face. If we make the right choices, the social, political, and economic dimensions of our community will be strengthened, both online and offline. This Digital 2020 conference is an excellent venue for considering these and other important questions. I thank you for your attention.